Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm recording now, so you know, maybe do or say up to now. Right now, it's like being recorded. Oh gosh! So you could record this and just give it to the police. I, I put it up on YouTube. Necessary. Ethan, that's on the video now. <laughs> Alright. So guys, that's gonna be our <laughs> intro for our Okay, Second Thessalonians, chapter two. Before we start, I will pray for us. I haven't prayed in a while. I usually ask everyone, I usually ask other people, but I'll pray for us today, or tonight, I should say. If y'all want to, if y'all bow your heads with me. Miss it. Right. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come for you tonight um, and just dive into your word of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Father. We know that what's um, here written by Paul was inspired by you and your words and the Holy Spirit moving through him. We pray that we can absorb uh, most of its uh, teaching within the words and the, and the scripture and that it retains in our hearts and that you bless each one of us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. So Simon, I just looked it up and I think camels are clean animals. They got cloven hooves and they eat of the field. So... So does anyone anybody want to read the chapter? I'll read. What do you want me to read to? The the whole chapter. Okay. Yeah, I'll read all. Actually, no, no, no. Read to <laughs> read to verse twelve. Read to verse twelve. Okay. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaim, proclaiming himself to be God. Do not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so they may re be revealed in his time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what's false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Thank you, thank you. We'll, we'll read 13 through 17 when we get to that. But I want to start off with chapter 2, 1 through 12. But, um, so, any first thoughts on that? Uh, that's a bit like a brief summary of Revelation before Revelation was even written. Uh, yeah, that happens a lot in Paul's writings. Mason? I mean, Lawless One, depicted as the beast, uh, killed by the breath of Lord Jesus. Um, you know, the coming of the Lawless One was by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders, as in the false prophet that exalts the beast. You know, just that stuff. People who refuse to believe. Lived, under, lived in unrighteous acts, which pretty much is what the sign, they'll gain the sign and continue living as they were rather than following God. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, ties with Revelation. Yeah. Actually, you mean, excuse me. So, as a, yeah, if it's tied with Revelation and, you know, he's telling the Thessalonians, obviously, He's going to tell, you know, the same message, per se, to each church that he, like like I said last week, has either, uh, which either he uh, built or, you know, was involved with or, you know, helped build with someone else. You know, he obviously wants to tell all these churches what's to come. So, um, you know, last week, 
we were saying um how well we were, we were getting the message but um uh, the overall message uh, the uh, the theme of it per se but last week he was talking to them saying um y'all guys are doing good y'all are overcoming the trials through y'all's faithfulness and endurance and that is pleasing to god and because of that i pray that he may count you worthy of his calling for you because the before chapter i mean the before book first thessalonians was how to live a life pleasing to god and so chapter uh chapter one you know he kind of restated a little bit of that and he gave a little bit of foreshadowing of the the consequences of not obeying but chapter two i like how the first word he says is now or in in the NIV it says concerning the coming of our lord but esv it says now concerning so he starts off with now in some um uh versions so to think about like he goes from a genuine a general topic of saying good job don't do this don't do this to more specific of what happens when you don't do it so now he says so, uh, so it says, according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it gets more into detail over here. And what detail the man of lawlessness, meaning the the, the sin, the the bad part, the, well, the part you don't want to be, the involved part that is only for the people that didn't listen to God and just treated him as nothing. And what let, And what happens when you take that route? At the very end, for the people who will be there, for the uh, for the um, the end of times, right? So, the first verse, obviously, you know, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. I want to ask the first thought. What do y'all think of that? So isn't it just kind of saying that you shouldn't get confused over any slight thing that might go against Why what not? your original belief is? Why not? Why not? Why, why, why is he telling them not to be alarmed uh, uh, when Jesus comes back? Or alarmed of anything saying that Jesus is coming back? Well, because aren't they supposed to technically be doing the right thing as best to their ability and kind of beyond that? So they shouldn't really be scared of it. And two, uh, they would pretty much know when Jesus is coming. They wouldn't have to be really told ahead of time because not even the prophets or the apostles knew the exact time that Jesus was coming. So they wouldn't necessarily just say hey jesus is coming back okay. now yeah. anyone else i mean in, in its context it sounds like this this verse is saying you know like, if someone says that the end times are here but that they're coming the the only way that we will truly know if that's even like an accurate theory is if after well, and it says afterwards if you know uh, let's see the rebellion has come first and the man of lawlessness is revealed in other words there will be exact signs that will make that theory even possible but even then you know don't be deceived be careful okay those those were my thought first thoughts too you know don't be distracted or don't be led astray by what um, other people say, right? That they think about it. We're only we're reading this from their context, but we're thinking about it in our context, right? But if you think mm. about it in their context, this it's still like first, second century of AD. And if that's so, Jesus hasn't been gone that long, right? So and Paul was there and he's saying because he says a little later on, uh, don't you remember thing? Don't you remember that I, uh, when I was with you, I told, used to tell you these things in verse five. So Paul was telling them already about these kind of things. 
the reason why he's saying this, um, I think, is because, you know, Jesus Jesus died only, a, like, a while back, you know. For him to say, you know, Jesus will come again, you know, uh, the, t um, the timing is, um, we won't know when he's coming back, but he will come back. And then some people say, oh, the time is near. It, it's, it's, um, it's, it's about to happen. They think, oh, okay, great. He died, he's coming back, we're going to go. Because they already had their faith, right? To me, I'm thinking... Well, why would Paul saying, don't be alarmed about all this? Why would that alarm them, right? Because they, if they believe in Jesus and then all of a sudden, like, you know, a, like, what, a decade, some decades pass, and then, or, and then Paul's like, okay, he's coming back. Wouldn't that be like, yes, he's coming back. Okay, easy. We're, it's not even that long. Let's go. Let's go. I'm ready to be with him. I'm ready to be with him. But he's like, no, don't, don't be alarmed. Why? Because people are saying he's coming back. Now, Paul, Paul is saying, though, later, though, he's not coming back until something happens with the man of lawlessness. Yes, he will come back. But he's saying, he and he's already thinking ahead, no, not in this era, not in this time. He's not coming back now. Don't be led astray. Now that now it makes sense. You know, don't be led astray that he's coming back now, because he's not. Because Paul knows, because God's talking to him, Paul knows that Jesus isn't coming now. He may not know the exact time, but he has a feeling. He knows because something is something has to happen. Things have to happen before Jesus comes back. And he's saying, don't 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 be alarmed. Don't be don't be tripped by what uh, people say, by what people write. It, even if it comes, even if it looks like it comes from us, that the time is at time is not. You know, it's right at the hand, about to happen soon. But in our case, yes, it could happen at any time. Is it? Uh, well, while you were talking about it, I was thinking they also might partly be uh, alarmed because all of this stuff is occurring. The situation they would be in and how most people assume the last days will be is there's going to be a lot of violence. There's going to be like all the earthquakes and stuff happening, like it says in Revelation. So if they're thinking this stuff is occurring, some people are going to get freaked out. Most people will get freaked out. Because of the situation they'll be in. Yeah, like, you know, Revelation hasn't really been, I don't think it's been written yet. So, like, they don't know They don't know the things that we know about what Revelation says. Yeah. What's that? I also feel like, um, like, don't be alarmed. Like, um, in some way, like, some people could be, like, scared. Like, oh, I, Jesus is coming back. And they know the word, right? And they're hearing these things from Paul. And, like, if he does, like, if, you know, they say, like, oh, he's coming back, like, they're scared because maybe they haven't been, you know, living righteously or something like that. And, you know, that could also alarm them because they're literally like, oh, I haven't been living how I'm supposed to. And they're like, oh, I'm going to be left behind. We can, we can all raise our hands and be guilty of that. Does it? Yeah. yeah. I agree with Lizette. I feel like with then they will be scared that they would be judged like hardcore because of how they live their life and like they would be like how it says hold on let me read it because they would be like i don't know like kind of in shambles in some way because of how they lived their life in the past and so like they wouldn't know really like how to make up for their sins and what they've done like in the past, like, like what was that was saying? Because it is a relatively new topic of, hey, Jesus just re oh, forgives your sins when you ask. They're used to the entire tradition of you have to sacrifice at this certain time with this animal and all this other stuff. So funny you bring yeah. up tradition. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Oh, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, uh, don't, don't worry, Ben. You'll you'll catch up soon soon enough. We're we're only on verse three. Or sorry, verse yeah, verse three. So he says Verse three of chapter two. Yeah, chapter two. Yeah. So okay. he says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, as we said, don't let anyone deceive you, you know. Don't be led astray. For that day will not come, you see, that day will not come until the rebe until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. And he tells like how like some some requirements for it to be revealed a little bit later on. And he says the man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Right? 
you know, first time I read this, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm just imagining some kind of person with like, you know, like, since it's um from Satan, you know, um, you know, he's like, uh, you know, has like a, maybe like a cape, a staff, or something. you know, he has all this aura about him that's like all dark and stuff, you know, but like, I see him physically walking up into like a giant temple and then like sitting down and like wanting proclaiming acting pretending like he is god you know that's what i'm thinking and in a sense you know that may happen a lot of bible inter- interpreters and everything you know they say well temple here could be temple in jerusalem temple in israel temple somewhere else some people say the um temple of our bodies you know the doctrines and the beliefs he gives off uh you know close uh sneakily gets into our mind and corrupts it and then into our hearts which we are living sacrifice and a uh, a living temple for god as it says and that that could be the temple there's many different uh, th- uh uh theories about what it means by god's temple but you know it says he will exalt himself over everything that is called god i mean obviously that goes against uh sorry, second the uh, second commandment second. yeah yeah what are you gonna say, Mason? Well, that uh, so you're talking of so the Antichrist is sort of what it's talking about, right? Yeah, that's another name for it. Devil. So, uh, in this context, if you think about it, it might be your, the temple of your body as well as the actual temple. So that mm-hmm. it, because so what, because his goal is to bring as many people to hell as possible with him. He knows he's going to hell, but he wants to make it worse for humans on earth. So he's ruining our mental state and our belief in God and the way our society works so that we go with him. And, but there's also like, I guess there could be sort of a pride thing to it. Like this is God's temple. So I'm just going to take over God's temple. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cause obviously saying wants to take everything uh, or tries to take everything from God. So what's the best way to do that? take away his people you know or because really god only cares if you know god cares about people you know that's why you sat try to sacrifice gold money cattle houses and all that stuff he doesn't care he's like i already have all that the one thing i the one thing i've set apart that i can't that i, I don't that i want y'all to control not me that, that i want y'all to choose and not me to choose and just multiply and create and all this is you know your your faith you want to if your love for me you know you know he's like i give you all this free will it's up to you whether you love me or love him you know everything else yes he you know he controls over the sun the moon the sky the earth the stars this pig if it ever moves i don't know but anyway verse uh five he says don't you remember that when i was with you i used to tell you these things right we were talking about uh that before and he says um, and now you know what is holding him back, so that he may revealed at the proper time. So before, you know, um, in chapter one, we were talking about how to uh, basically live a life pleasing to God, you know, and faith and all that. He is, um, he, he might, it doesn't, uh, I doesn't say explicitly um, all the things he told them, but one of the things he told them, you know, was that uh, what, well, as it says here, uh, what was holding the man of lawlessness back, right? Because he says this guy has to come in order for the for um this man has to come back. Oh, for the coming of Lord. Sorry, my brain's working. I'm stuttering for so for, for for a while. I don't know why. But um, so now we gotta think. Okay, well, what's holding him back? And Paul's saying, well, you know what's holding him back. And then they're like, yeah, we know what's holding him back. You wanna give more detail? And he's like. Well, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. You know? And, uh... So basically, the requirement for the man of lawlessness is to, uh, to come on the earth is that what's the opposite of man of lawlessness is Jesus, the, uh, the body of Christ, right? Well, in this, in this like period of when he's writing this jesus isn't on the earth so you gotta think well why is it why is where's the man of the this is that was probably also a thought about it you know they maybe they knew that jesus was 
uh, um, stopping him because he was the perfect man on earth. You know, no man, you know, no, there can't be a perfect and then a completely utter corrupt, you know, at the same time. So they thought, okay, well, he, you know, maybe he's, maybe they thought, you know, he's dead now. Where, where is this man then, right? Maybe he's already, is he showing up, right? And then he says, you know, he's already, it's already at work, okay? So is he, is he being born? What's happening here, you know? But me, you, Ethan, Ben, you know, we're all part of the body of Christ. So if the body of Christ is everyone who believes and wants to have a relationship with Jesus and follows him and obeys him, then technically right now, the, Jesus isn't gone. The body of Christ has not left this earth. The head did, because Jesus is the head of the body of Christ, but the body is still here. Everyone that makes up the body is still here on this earth. That's why a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, uh, they, you know, will be here during the whole rapture, during the whole corruption of the earth, during all that, and then we'll, we'll be saved at the very end, and, and everyone else will die. That's a funny face Colin's making. But um, but that's not really how it is, you know. He's saying the man of lawlessness will come when, implying, of course, Jesus, you know, when Jesus uh, is gone, when the body of Christ is gone. So if we haven't gone yet, then the only makes sense. The only thing that makes sense is that when all this happens, is that we must go too, right? So when we get called up into heaven. Then all these horrible things will happen to the people caused by their own actions and thoughts and willingness to go out in this manner of a way. Because it, it says in uh, verse 11, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so they, that they will believe the lie. Because they didn't want to believe, God hands them over to their sin and says, okay, then this was you. You wanted this. Here you go. And he takes every he takes the cream of the crowd because it says a uh, thief at a night, right? The thief, um, well, you know, it spreads out the weeds, right? And was it? lost my analogy on that one. But yeah, he he takes the good and then boom, all the all the rest. Oh yeah, that's what it was. You know, they're harvesting both. You know, the thief it said in a parable he spreads out the the weeds, weeds, right? And then they uh, the good crop and the weeds grow together. And then um, the, um, the farmer says, okay, let it all grow. It's okay. And then at the very end, of, during harvest comes, you know, they, they uh, gather them all. And then they, he takes the harvest, the good part, and then he throws the weeds into the fire. He doesn't just chunk it all over there like, oh, oh, one went in there. Well, he just, it was just a casualty. We'll take the other ones. No, he, he carefully brings all the good things to him. And then throws out the bad things. Make sure I'm not losing anyone. I know I'm kind of stuttering a lot. But anyway, uh, verse where was I? The one who now, yeah. So the one who now holds it back, we can do so until he's taken out of the way. You know, God's talking to Paul. Paul's like, okay, I understand what's happening now. That's why he tells him, don't be alarmed, don't be deceived, because we as the body of Christ have not gone yet. Now you as a believer, chapter one, you have faith. You must continue to do your work until God calls you either or no, they won't be taken away until you until, you know, you die and then be go go into heaven. You know, we are the body of Christ. The man of lawlessness will not come yet. We will not. We will not see the man of lawlessness. No matter what anyone says, we will not because uh, when he comes, we will be gone, whether dead or taken away. I mean, either way, that sounds pretty good compared to what will happen. But in verse 8, he says, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So uh, in part B, uh, chapter verse 7 says, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he's taken away. So like I said, until we're taken away, then he will come. And then in, in verse 8, he continues it and says, then the lawless one will be revealed. And the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. So when he comes, you know, there's those years of, of uh, uh breaking of and and disintegrating and fire and beasts and all these horrible plagues and all this right and then with with all that after he's corrupted everyone after they had their time on earth to do what they will do then he says okay now i will overthrow you i will take you and just with the breath of his mouth it says doesn't even say he 
grabs lightning and strikes the earth. He it doesn't say he does this miraculous hero type saving thing. It just says with the breath of his mouth, because he's that powerful. With just spoken word, it's just a, whew. just like that, he destroyed the splendor of his coming. He destroyed this magnificent person who was to sit in the temple of God and go, "I am God," and he's like, whew. "Bow before me." All who want to live that perfect life. And they think, oh, yeah, this must be nice, you know. But you think about it like this, that sin, yeah, you may live an easier life, but that won't lead to a better life. I mean, they don't understand that concept. And when when everyone who wants to do that does that, you know, they get those sixes on their, uh, their palms or foreheads. And then Jesus, with just a breath, destroys that marvelous show that he's trying to put on. And it goes in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, who played in all kinds of counterfeit mira uh, counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. So now it, it confirms that this lawless one, for the people who didn't already put two and two together, is by the works of Satan. Because he's trying to get the people away from God as far as he can. That's why he puts the guilt, the shame, the regret, because he wants to know there is a border still there. He wants you to think that. And that there is no common ground between y'all. And say, nope, you've done too much. God will not forgive you. Let me show you an alternative life. I can grant y'all some good things if you want. But in verse 10 it says, And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So with that, that he puts in that you will never be loved by God, then he, go, then he says, well, love me. And he, he blinds them so he can't so they can't see the truth. And so they perish slowly but surely. Remember that uh, analogy I gave you on, I forgot what church of Revelation, but the frog in the boiling water, you put in at once, it'll jump out. But then you put in cold water, put the frog in, slowly turn up the heat. With the fog blinding its eyes, and the temperature getting adjusted to its skin, hardening the heart, you know. Then you don't realize anything, what happened. And all of a sudden, you're gone. Life sucked out. Corpse. That's it. And then, boom, where are you? Eternal life. Hey, you got eternal life. Not the life you wish for, but in hell. Burning with gnashing of teeth, it says. So, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so they will believe the lie, you know. They chose to fate themselves, but... He's selling this to uh, the Thessalonians because he's saying these things will happen. And obviously in our time, we can see that at work. You know, we can see all the kind of evils that's in the world. But at their time, yes, there are uh, idol worshipers, right? And there are people, you know, who will flat out, you know, be like Satanists and, you know, um, just and like just flat out deny God and just feel like, I don't know how to explain this, but like back then, you know, it's a completely different world. You know, you were there were people who gathered, you know, for church who wanted to be with God, and then there were so people who just they didn't even do it so, like today. You know, people do it subtly. You know, they try to like, oh yeah, God's cool, and then they don't mean it. Now these people just flat out, you know, proclaimed and projected that kind of uh uh like oh, I don't want to be with God. You know, and they just it, it's out of the I'm getting off on well, a that's... tangent. I know it's, it happens now, but, you know, it's more subtle. Uh, no, what I mean, Simon, is, like, that would probably be better than what people do nowadays. Because you at least do what people were thinking. Yeah, and that's why it's easier to work with people who do that than people who are lukewarm, like the people nowadays, Laodicea, of Revelation. Now remember, church. Anyway, and it says, um, and so that uh, all will be... Um, condemned who will not believe the truth by the light and wickedness. So like I was saying, they're talking to Thessalonians because he's saying, I don't want this to happen to you. You're my brother in Christ. You're my sisters in Christ. I don't want to see this happen to my own, I can't say flesh and blood, but it feels like flesh and blood because being with Christ and being in him, you know, it's, it's, even, it's even stronger than like a sibling or stronger than, than just a, a mother, you know. It's, it's stronger than that. The bond is greater. And he's saying, I don't want to see that happen in you. Because I, I, I'm involved with you, you know. I, I, I love y'all guys, you know. I, please don't believe the lie. And he says, and so that will be condemned who have not believed. I know y'all have believed, but do not backslide. 
and foreshadowing to the church of Ephesus. Don't backslide and don't stop. Don't stop believing the truth. Don't start delighting in the wickedness. Because he explained already what will happen because of that. And even though the man of lawlessness has not come, it says before in verse 7, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. The man hasn't come, but the spirit's already here. It's already tempting many people. And he's saying, don't fall into that. And definitely, definitely don't get tempted by it. Don't even think about it. He's trying to say, don't even, don't even just give a, even a moment to it. Because a moment's all it needs to take, take you, grasp you, and pull you to its side. Once it gets a grip, it's got a firm grip. And the only one who can break that grip is Jesus, is God. And he will rip it, and he will take it away from you if you ask him to. But it's all in choices you make. And so, Mason, now will you read verses 13 through 17? sure 13 through 17 but we ought always to give thanks to god for you brothers beloved by the lord because god chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our lord jesus christ so then brothers stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us either by our spoken word or by our letter now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So it's kind of like the, thank you, it's kind of like the Thanksgiving um, and prayer in chapter one, you know, because he, he he knows that even after talking about such a, a, a grim and, and, and gruesome and hurtful and, you know, deep topic like this, he knows there's still room. There's still the the ability to give all the thanks and joy to God, because he's like, I want you know. He's like, it's like I, I give joy to y'all because y'all the ones who stay faithful. You know, he can relate to them of of, of faith and, and endurance because he's in prison while writing this. He's he's literally going through a tough time like this, and he's telling them we ought to give thanks to God. We ought to give the glory to God. He doesn't care what's happening to him. He's like. He's putting them in front of himself, you know. I pray for y'all. I pray for y'all. I pray for y'all. He's, he's, he's like, he even knows his time's coming, right? This is Second Thessalonians, one of the last book, and you know, in the Bible. Now, I don't know if these time orders are right with the accordance of uh, how they're written chronologically, but Probably he, no. he knows he's about the end of his road. And even though he's like that, he's not saying, "God bless me, let me live a long life, let me live a bit longer so I can do more things." He's already been doing that since God called him in Damascus. And now he's saying, I want to see that in y'all. I want y'all to go even further. Y'all guys, I want y'all to surpass me. I want you to do more. So he says in 13, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord. Because from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through relief in the truth. God chose y'all. Y'all y'all, were like, like children to him y'all came up to him and said father and he said these 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 i will pour my blessing these i will pour the talents and, and, and my time i will wait patiently on these guys because they they want to do my work it's just like it's just like a it would like like uh you're going you're a little bit uh like what six seven something you know going to like a grandfather uh yeah going to like grandfather you know you're like hi granddad or something you know like they 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 hug you know they can take you in you know like hey how you doing you know they you know, it's that bond right there but it's even stronger with god you know if if our if our parents or if we become parents you know if we can know if we know how to give good gifts to our children how much more will god give good gifts to us it's that kind of a ratio, you know. We, if we're this good, God's this good, infinitely better. Infinitely better. Yes, we. I will never live up to that, but you know, He called you to this. Him. So He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we pass on you, whether by word of mouth or by letter of the tradition. Now, in ESV, it has the word tradition in there. I just added of the tradition. Because I know it's in there in ESV. Now I'll talk about that. Because Mason, I said I did say we were going to mention that. 
But he's saying this, he called you, he's called you to this, to our gospel, because you know the Lord has many different callings and many different paths for it, many different people, right? But the main objective through all those callings is that he puts you in a place, he puts you in a situation, he puts you where he wants you to he puts you where he wants you to be so that you can share the gospel. The ultimate goal is that you can share the gospel with whom you're around. It's not just if you're Let's say you go out to be a football player, you know, you know, he's not putting you just to be a football player. He's putting you where, you know, you walk with him. He gave you the ability. He gave you that talent. And now he's saying, okay, now you, let, let's say, you know, you reach a uh, pro foot, uh, you know, that uh, pro league, you know, now, hey, you got teammates. Why don't you talk to them about Jesus? You know, the ultimate goal there is that you spread the gospel in the place that God has put you in. And he says, so then brothers, stand firm, even where you are. Yes. NFL. Yeah. That place. Even even though you might be in a tough spot, and he's like, I can relate to that. And he says, um, you know, because I'm in prison, of course. Well, not me, but Paul. And he says, um, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you. Because, you know, it says the mystery of lawlessness, the secret power of it, it's already at work. So obviously, these kind of, uh, the, the body of Christ is the one that's going to be trying to uh, break down the most. So he's saying stand firm. And he says, hold on to the teachings we pass to you, whether by word or, by, or mouth or by letter. And it says tradition in ESV because tradition doesn't mean some something done because of, oh, that's what we did before and before and before. So we kind of just kind of just do it because, you know, that's what we've always done. No, tradition um, means, you know, the... The belief, the the doctrines, as this year, the teachings instructed to people orally or or uh, with speech, because God gave so many laws to Moses um, by um, by speaking to him. He didn't say go in, uh, you know. He didn't say, uh, well, I mean, he did write the tablets, but I said all this is saying that it's not just some bland tradition you do over and over again because you have to. It's because we're teaching you. We're instructing you to do this, that God, because God has instructed us to tell you how he wants it to be done, you know. He's saying this because speaking is a powerful thing. With speaking, now, act, yes, actions speak louder than words. But what did I say one time a while back, you know, um, a foolish man speaks because he has to say something. A wise man speaks because he has something to say. Words can do can do powerful things, especially in God's case, where he can just what breathe in his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. He can destroy this grand opening of the lawless man. And all he has to do is just breathe. Dang, listen. So, uh, tradition, the internet says, is oh, okay. a doctrine not explicit in the Bible, but held to direct from the oral teachings of Jesus and the apostles, which goes along with what it says because. It said you were taught by us either by a spoken word or by our letter. So it's whatever they gained from their understanding of being with Jesus and reading the Bible to pretty much give it to the public. So the stuff they wrote down in their letters to, in this case, the Thessalonians would be part of the tradition or doctrine that was given to them by letter. Yeah, exactly. Anyone else have any any quick thoughts on that? So basically, tradition is just uh, I do peer pressure I got a from dead people. Little quote um, from uh, you have a quote from Ethan. Um, that's pretty close to that. It's, uh, let's see, let's see if I can remember it. Uh -huh. Basically talking about, you know, like what traditions are. And it's either it's like the dead faith of the living, as in you just do it just because. Mm -hmm. Or it's the living faith of the dead, in other words, you know, traditions passed down from the people who knew Christ and walked with him and received their traditions from him. Stuff like that. 
So kind of like how it was in the beginning where most people went to church, like in this day and age, just because it was passed down in the Torah and all the high priests said, hey, you got to do this. So they would go and do the sacrifices they had to and things like that. But then Jesus comes along and he has stuff they can do. And that's pretty much the tradition derived from the apostles. Yes, that's it exactly. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's a good insight right there. And so, in verse 16, as he continues, I like this, I like this talking we're having. But in verse 16, he says, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. So, you know, he's not just punishing people because of their actions. He's also, you know, giving comfort to those who need comfort, encouragement to those who need encouragement, and um, uh, faith to those who are uh, stumbling, you know. He's helping people too. And it says, encourage your hearts and strengthen. Uh, he encouraged your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and work. Because, I mean, in chapter 1, it says, uh, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. And so he's saying this, uh, may he do these things um, out, of, uh, out, of, out of faith, uh, for he loved you, and that by his grace, which is e eternal. And so, you Please. know, a thing that, a thing that I, I think that, think about, you know, is am I standing firm, you know? Am I, am I truly, truly giving it all? Because, you know, it's, it's not just some um, uh, small talk we're having, you know, there's actually consequences to things that you do. And there are rewards and punishments to things you do and say, and all of this has a meaning, you know, there's purpose in your life. Depend, you know, it depends on how you live your life. So, I mean, you got to think, you know, am I, am I doing the work that God has called me to do? Am I, is he, uh, am I doing what I should be doing where he has put me? Or am I just like most people ignore it and then go and take part in this lawlessness without thinking about it consciously and just, you know, like, oh, I'm not, I'm not strained from God. I don't go to church, but I'm not strained from God. But, you know, deep down, you could care less. You got to think, are you standing firm? What were you going to say, Mason? Oh, uh, one sec. Let me remember it. What was I going to say? Oh, so pretty much the reward system is what I was thinking whenever you read it. Because... Mm -hmm. It's you do something good, God's going to bless you. You do something bad, you'll get a punishment, which should be the basic way the world works in general. But it isn't. So God saying this probably is better than what most people can hope for. So if they do something good and continue to follow Jesus and the teachings he has, they gain comfort and hope in the fact that Jesus is going to come back. Jesus is going to help them. And come, and the comfort is Jesus is with me because that's what is taught, is that Jesus is with us in our hearts at all times and helps us through all the challenges we face. Now, don't, don't mislead anyone there. Mason saying this because, yes, it's true, but also to the ones that don't believe in Jesus, he's trying to reach out to you. He's not just talking to the people that are righteous in faith. You know, when he came on earth, he didn't just talk to the good people and the ones who, quote unquote, you know, don't need doctors or medical uh, help. He's talking to the people who do need that that uh, um, that replenishing, that restoration, and uh, that that need of uh, need of uh, someone to help them. He's going to those people who are broken. So yes, he helps those. Who were once now, Mason, we gotta remember our origin, you know, we were once broken, we were sinners, and we still are. And then, like I said uh last week, you know, the goal isn't to sin more uh sin, sorry, the goal isn't to sin uh to be sinless, it's to sin less. And while we understand that there are some people who out there who haven't accepted Jesus or really even thought about it kind of like this, 
And so this is specifics. What happens and what it's going to be like when, as the body of Christ gets removed. And there are some people who will be there. Not taken out of the world when we do. Or not not we, but as the body of Christ does. Now, we, we actually might. You know, it's it's been around 2,000 years. We It could come at any time. It might come a year. It might come 10 years. It might come three seconds. You know, you never know. One, two, three. Oh, they come three seconds. But, yeah. And so it says, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God, Father, our Father, who loved us and by his grace to give us eternal encouragement and good help, hope, Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and work. So first, the man of lawlessness. And because he gives them specifications on that, he says, stand firm. Because while this man of lawlessness will not happen in your time, the spirit, the the, the uh, temptations of Satan, the the acts of, of wickedness, the... The uh, the people the uh, people who just um, who delight in that in that kind of in that kind of wickedness they are here right now. So he says, don't uh, don't forget that, and go even further, go even deeper where God wants you to be. <laughs> Anyone have any more comments before we end? Yeah. Okay, I'll I'll pray us out. Everyone bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, we we thank you for this time we had and that we could uh get into your word. Even even if it to most people it they would say uh it's offensive, it's it's too deep. They don't they would not care about thinking about something that matters so much to them. But I, I think for the ones who came here today, uh, who wanted to get into that kind of a uh, that situation, even though maybe uh, awkward, even though it may be uh, embarrassing, but Father, you put us where you want us to be put, so that you can work in us to work into others, that we can tell others about about the gospel, about the good news. As Father, we we thank you for watching over us as we had this time of just being together and as as a, as in the body of Christ. We love you. It's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen.